Hey everybody, I am getting on here for just a little bit here and I want to do a teaching and this is going to be a follow up to a post that I did last month, but I want to talk about why we must stop spiritualizing our dysfunction. And I want to talk about that a little bit. What do I mean by that? I did this post on Facebook last month and I said this, I said, some people never mature because they constantly spiritualize their dysfunction. And then I kind of spoke into that more and I gave some examples into what that was and I got a quite a bit of response to that post. I had people asking for more information. I had people saying, you know, could you write about this topic? Could you, you know, teach more on this topic? And so I felt like it would be a good idea to do a live teaching on this and to share more context for this and share more of my heart behind this. And here's the thing when it comes to this topic, right, about spiritualizing dysfunction. One, we must not ever deny spiritual reality. So spiritual realities are true. They are legitimate. We live in a world where there is a natural world and there is a spiritual world. And so we walk in this balance. In fact, we as human beings, we are body, we are soul, we are spirit. So again, there's a balance there between natural realities, spiritual realities, and then even that realm of the soul, the mind, the will, the emotions. And so while we must never deny the reality of the spiritual realm, we must also be careful not to, um, you know, overemphasize something or get out of balance, okay, and not spiritualize everything, okay? So we have to be careful not to spiritualize everything. And, you know, so again, the quote that I said was, I said, some people never mature because they constantly spiritualize their dysfunction. And when that happens, people end up kind of in a perpetual cycle of avoiding responsibility, avoiding accountability, because they spiritualize things. Everything is spiritualized, so they never actually have to own something, take ownership of it, take responsibility, or be accountable for an action or something that happened. And as I was contemplating this and thinking about doing this teaching, I was just praying into it, and I was actually brought back to um, a passage that I talked about not too long ago in a message, but uh, Genesis Three, the original fall of man, I saw this very thing happening, that dysfunction or sin in this case was being spiritualized. And so the context of Genesis 3, it's the fall of mankind. It's when, uh, you know, the, the serpent comes in, the devil comes in, he tempts Eve with the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She obviously takes the tree, I mean, from the, the fruit of the tree, she eats it, she gives to Adam. And then in chapter three, after that happens, um, when God comes to actually confront this sin, he comes to talk to them about it. Um, it's just so fascinating, the response, and this is such classic human nature of deflecting responsibility. Okay, so notice this progression. And so God comes to them uh, in verse nine. He says, where are you? And uh, he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid. I was naked. So I hid. Uh, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from this tree that I've told you not to eat from? Okay. And then here's what Adam says. He says, the woman whom you gave me, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree. She gave me from the fruit. And then I ate it. And so basically Adam is finding a way to deflect responsibility. And so notice that he essentially blames God. I mean, he blames his wife, he blames Eve, uh, but he says, you, he says, God, you, you gave me this woman, you know, you, you, uh, you know, this is the woman that you created that you gave to be with me. She, it's her fault. And so she, he's basically blame shifting there. And then, so God addresses Eve. It says, the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? She says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. This is the first case where we hear the devil made me do it essentially, right? The devil made me do it. Now, here's the thing. There is some measure of truth in what Eve said, because yes, the serpent did come in. He was involved. The devil was involved in this deception, but notice that she spiritualized it to avoid responsibility. And then Eve spiritualized it. I mean, sorry, Adam. Adam spiritualized and basically said, God, you, you gave me this woman. And so he's, he's avoiding responsibility by blaming it on God. She's avoiding responsibility by blaming it on the devil. And again, there's a measure of truth in that. Yes, did God create Eve to be with Adam? Yes, did Eve eat it and then give it to Adam? Yes, 
But notice again that the pattern here is that it's a deflecting of responsibility and accountability. Did, did the serpent come in and deceive Eve and use temptation and use deception to, to get her to be, you know, to be convinced to eat from this tree that God had said not to eat from? Yes, that is true. However, it's putting too much emphasis on the role of the devil and it's not taking responsibility for her own actions. And so there, right in the very beginning of time, right with the first temptation, right with the fall of mankind, we see this tendency to avoid responsibility and to spiritualize it in order to not be held accountable. So this goes back to the beginning. This goes back to Genesis chapter 3. And so what do I mean when I say we should stop spiritualizing dysfunction? Essentially, that's when we blame God or the devil for our own issues. Okay, it's blaming something spiritual for our own issues. Blaming God, saying, you know, God made me do it. The Holy Spirit, you know, said this or that when it was actually our own actions or we were responsible for it. Okay, or it's blaming uh, a spiritual attack. It's blaming the devil on something that maybe we did or that happened to us. Okay, and so again, spiritualizing our dysfunction, that's when we blame God We blame the devil or some other spiritual principle or reality uh, for our own issues. Again, to be clear, like I said in the beginning, okay, we are not to deny spiritual realities, all right? There are spiritual realities. Absolutely. It's a huge part of the scriptures. It's a huge part of our Christian life. Paul talked about this, right? He said, our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. So we're not to deny the reality of spiritual warfare, uh, you know, demonic attack. I mean, I, I mean, I'm involved in deliverance ministry on a very regular basis. I cast out demons on a very regular basis. So I'm not minimizing the, the impact, the influence of demonic spirits or the kingdom of darkness in any way, shape or form. But there is a balance. There is a healthy balance that we have to find and walk in because not everything is spiritual. And we have to be careful not to try to use spiritual truth, spiritual realities to cover something when it's actually our own issues. <clears throat> and this tendency, this tendency to over-spiritualize or hyper-spiritualize or to you know, spiritualize our own dysfunction, it is especially common in the charismatic stream, in the prophetic stream, because we believe in the spiritual gifts. We believe in spiritual warfare. We believe in these realities. And so, you know, I mean, these are, these are biblical realities, right? I, you know, I'm, I'm a continuationist. I'm a charismatic because, because it's scriptural. It's scriptural to believe in the continuation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's scriptural to believe in the prophetic or in spiritual warfare. All those are very real. But this whole pendulum swing can happen even more so in our charismatic stream, in our prophetic circles, uh, because because we embrace these kind of spiritual realities, and so we have to be careful. In fact, I, I actually think there's these subtle forms of Gnosticism that can creep back into the church. I don't want to get on a tangent of church history, but just for, as a quick side note, Gnosticism was one of the early heresies in the early church, and it was a hyper spirituality. That's what Gnosticism was. Gnosticism was essentially this teaching that said that physical matter doesn't matter. It says that, that, that only spiritual things matter. That's what Gnosticism basically is. And that's why in 1 John, he's actually dealing with Gnostic heresies. And he says that any spirit that denies that Jesus came in the flesh is not of God. Because in Gnostic teaching, they would deny that Jesus came in the flesh because they said fle- all flesh is evil and only spiritual things matter. And so... You know, we might not be seeing those exact things happening in our charismatic stream, but I think there are subtle forms of Gnostic beliefs creeping in where it's a hyper spirituality. It's a it's a hyper focus and a denial of natural things, a denial of even practical things sometimes. And so we got to be careful about these kind of things, not to spiritualize our dysfunction. Now, let me I'm just going to run through some examples. This this can take on many forms. This can take on many shapes, many forms. 
I'm going to run through some, some examples. This is not necessarily an exhaustive list, but just some j- examples of what do I mean by this? What do I mean about spiritualizing dysfunction? Okay. Uh, these are some of the things I've seen over many years of being in pastoral ministry. Um, so here's, here's one. Uh, legitimate correction gets perceived as a spiritual attack. Okay, that's an example of spiritualizing dysfunction. Okay, so when a person brings a legitimate correction, okay, let's say if a person is in a position of oversight or leadership and they bring a a legitimate correction, I'm not not talking about uh, false accusation, I'm I'm not talking about abusive behavior, I'm talking about legitimate godly correction, pastoral care, pastoral correction. And when, when that happens, when a person is kind of operating in this cycle of spiritualizing things, what happens is they'll perceive it and they'll say, that's a spiritual attack. I'm being attacked by the enemy, right? The enemy's trying to, you know, get after me. The enemy's trying to silence my voice or this or that, right? And we, you know, what is that doing? That's actually, um, it's actually cutting out their ability to grow, to mature. Because rather than being able to receive a legitimate correction, they deflect it and they spiritualize it and they say, well, that's, you know, I'm just under spiritual attack and it just perpetuates this cycle then where, where maturity doesn't come. So that's one example of that. Here's, here's, here's another example. And again, I've seen all these over, over years of, uh, you know, ministry, pastoral ministry, leading church, all that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes uh, people will share, um, you know, grievances or offenses they have, like they might be offended or they might, you know, have be upset about certain things and they package it as a prophetic word. And they say, well, this is a word from God. And they'll share, you know, a bunch of things that they're offended about, or they'll share a bunch of things they're upset about, or things that, or, you know, or just ways that they think the church should go, direction they think the church should go. They want, you know, they, they, they want the pastor to do this, or the church to do this, or the person, whoever it is, to do this. And so they, but they package it as a, thus saith the Lord. Package it as a, you know, God said this. And so then that makes you feel like, oh man, I, I have to receive this. I have to, I have to, you know, you know, go with this or else I'm disobeying God. Right? That's a that's a major example of how we can spiritualize dysfunction, right? Not being able to process these things in a healthy way and just putting this label of God said on it. Now, do I believe in the pre- the prophetic? Absolutely, absolutely. God can speak through other people. He does all the time. And we embrace the prophetic, but we also are to test and weigh it as well. And that's one of the reasons why, because sometimes when people are sharing things that, that they're saying, thus saith the Lord on, it might just be from their own soul. The Bible talks about that, where people are sharing things out of their own heart as if God is saying it. So that's why we have to weigh some of those things. That's an example of spiritualizing dysfunction. Um, <clears throat> here's, here's some other ones. Uh, if there's an inability to navigate conflict well and there's the kind of relational breakdowns and then it gets blamed on a spirit like like uh, oftentimes it'll be like the leviathan spirit like well it must be a leviathan spirit that's why you know we're not able to navigate this conflict and that's why and again is there such thing as a leviathan spirit it sure seems like it in scripture but i am a little bit leery about some of the teaching out there that takes little parts of scripture and just kind of extrapolates all these symptoms and all these teachings into uh, you know just these these, um, these these principles and these teachings that we don't have much spiritual or scriptural I should say foundation for. So um, can the devil interfere in relationships? Absolutely, absolutely. And so could that be a possibility? Yes, but that's not always the case. Sometimes maybe we just have trouble with our communication. Sometimes maybe we just need to overcome fear of conflict. Okay, so again, there's a healthy balance here. So I'm not saying there's never a spiritual attack on relationships. Absolutely, we need to recognize it when it's there. But again, we throw these spiritual words out there like, oh, it must be this spirit. It must be that spirit. That's why this is happening. That's why we have to be really careful that we're actually not just avoiding our own accountability and responsibility. Um, Here's another example. We're going through some examples of how you know, we can spiritualize dysfunction. Sometimes when people have uh, like internal issues of the heart, maybe like insecurities, maybe a need for healing, a need for deliverance, uh, maybe there's wrong mindsets, there's a need for, re- uh, for, for renewing the mind, but they're not dealt with because the spiritual um, environment's always blamed. It's always blamed on, you know, a bad spiritual environment. Where man, it's just you know, there's such there, there was such heaviness in the room, or there's such this in the room, there's such that in the room, um, and it's always blamed on an external spiritual environment. 
And again, there's a measure of truth in all these. It's about balance and it's about weighing it on a case by case basis and discerning the difference. Okay. But, um, but I've seen this where, where sometimes it's actually, actually sometimes we think we're discerning something in the atmosphere when it's actually something going on in our own life, going on in our own heart. And then we, but we, but we project it externally and then we don't actually have to face that again. So again, that's, that's another example of how we can spiritualize things. Um, how about this one where there can be rebellion that gets covered with prophetic language. And the classic example in the Bible is Korah's rebellion in the book of Numbers. Korah's rebellion. And, and he, you know, him and he, he, he got a whole group of people and they were rebelling against Moses, who was God's appointed authority, Moses and Aaron and Miriam, there was, there was a God appointed leadership. And, and, but, but he spiritualized it. He said, you know, do you think you're the only one who hears from God? You know, we hear from God too, and all this kind of stuff. Um, right. So sometimes actually uh, prophetic language can be used as a cover for rebellion. Um, there's all kinds of examples we can use here. How about, how about this one? Sometimes there is paranoia or suspicion, and it actually gets portrayed as discernment, okay, where, where people are operating, you know, and again, this is, discernment is legitimate. We need discernment. And sometimes God wants to reveal when there's a wolf in sheep's clothing, Okay, but then it can it can veer off into these certain extremes or, or, or get into the realm of suspicion or paranoia where we're constantly looking at people through a lens of suspicion, through a lens of paranoia, and we're calling it discernment. And, you know, I've, 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 I've seen this get very uh, off track and cause damage uh, in, in, in churches where where, you know, everyone's, you know, there's, there's, there's this constant sense of paranoia, suspicion. Well, we think this person's a Jezebel. We think that person's a witch. We think this, and it's like, wow, man, is, is the whole church just, you know, this and that? And, um, and you know, are there, are there times when wolves come in and, and try? Absolutely. The Bible talks about being, being aware of wolves. Are there times when a witch will come in and try to pretend to be a Christian? Absolutely. That can certainly happen. Um, but, but so can suspicion so can paranoia, and then that releases uh, suspicion in a congregation, false accusations against people, and people being labeled this and labeled that, and it, and it can cause a big mess, right? So we have to be careful and mature and grow to, to, to discern the difference between God-given, Holy Spirit-given discernment versus soulish suspicion that's based in fear, it's based in paranoia, and it, it causes uh, you know, false things to be said, Okay, um, here's, here's another example. There can be, maybe sometimes if a person has like a lack of self-discipline and a lack of just the ability to follow through, they can, they can blame things on a spirit. They can say, well, it's a spirit of delay is, you know, keeping me from advancing. Well, you know, maybe, but also maybe it's just a lack of discipline or maybe you're not in God's timing, right? So, Again, we just have to be super careful not to always throw spiritual labels out and not just to assume everything is spiritual. Okay, so I just went through a bunch of examples. I'm not sure how many I did there, uh, six, seven, eight examples there. There could be others. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but I'm just trying to you know, give you a feel for what, I, what do I mean by this. Um, and again, I, I, I just want to reiterate, I'm not ignorant of the devil's schemes. I'm not saying I'm perfect in my spiritual perception and discernment, but I'm not unaware of the fact that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm not unaware of the fact that the Bible talks us to be vigilant against the attack of the enemy. Again, I cast out demons on a very regular basis. I have seen how evil spirits influence people and, and how that can be a, 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 a very real thing that impacts people's lives. Okay, So I'm not denying spiritual attack. I'm not denying spiritual warfare. And sometimes the issue is spiritual. Many times it is, it, it is uh, spiritual. Sometimes the issue is a spiritual attack, but sometimes it's actually not. Okay. Sometimes it's actually not a spiritual attack. Sometimes it might be our own character issues. Sometimes it might be our own need for renewing the mind or you know, deliverance or healing. Okay. Sometimes it might be just life. Life can be difficult. We can go through trials. We can go through circumstances. We can go through relational things. We live in a fallen world. Sometimes it's flesh. Sometimes it's flesh. We're dealing just with, you know, humanity here. 
Okay, so sometimes it is a spiritual attack, but sometimes it's not a spiritual attack. Sometimes it's not the devil. Sometimes it's you. Sometimes it's me. Sometimes it's just us being, you know, human. Okay, and so knowing the difference here is actually important for maturing in Christ. Knowing the difference is important for maturing in Christ because we rob ourselves of maturity of growing up in the Lord if we constantly are avoiding responsibility and accountability by using spiritual language. King Saul did this. Whenever God had commanded him you know, to wipe out, um, I think it was the Amalekites, um, it's in 1 Samuel, God, God had directed him through Samuel to wipe out this nation, and, and he didn't. He, he, kept, he kept certain ones back. In fact, God told him to get rid of even just all the animals and and, and, and he did it. And so he, he kept them back. And when, when Samuel confronted Saul on this, he used a spiritual excuse. He said, oh, we kept the best, you know, of, the, of, of, of these, um, you know, herds and these, these uh, animals to, to, to make sacrifices to God, right? To make a sacrifice. He used a spiritual religious, you know, reason, right? So again, this can be human nature. This can be, this is, this is human nature to do this, to deflect and to avoid, um, but if we do that, and if we consistently do that, it puts us in a perpetual cycle where we will not mature in the Lord. And so if we are constantly spiritualizing our issues by either blaming it on uh, God or on, on the devil, when it's actually stuff we need to deal with in ourselves, then it robs us of maturity. You know, Paul the Apostle, even when he was addressing the, the Corinthians, because the Corinthians you know, they're all about spirituality. They're all about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the prophetic. And Paul had to bring order. Paul had to bring balance. He had to bring correction. He had to, he had to make sure they were walking in love. He had to make sure they weren't, weren't just causing confusion. And he said something. He said, the spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, you can't just say, well, the Holy Spirit just, you know, he, he made me do it. The Holy Spirit, you know, you can't just blame everything on on the Lord. You can't just say, well, it was God. He made me do this, or God made me do that. Or No, actually, the, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control. That's actually one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And I believe in spiritual manifestations and the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, all that. But Paul brought that balance and he brought that correction to that church that was very much hyper uh, into the spiritual gifts, okay? And so, I don't want us to rob ourselves. I don't want to rob you. I don't want us to rob me. I don't, I don't, I don't want us to be robbed of, of the opportunity to grow in Christ, to mature. And so I think really the best, you know, um, you know how, do we, how do we differentiate between what is actually spiritual versus just natural? I think, I mean, I don't think there's any just formula to know that, but I think it's going to take us being uh, humble, walking in humility, walking in humility, because I think the, the, the root cause of us deflecting like this, and you know, like I said, it goes back to the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, how they deflected and blamed all this. It goes back to pride, right? So, so really, it comes down to we need to humble ourselves and be willing to actually examine and ask the Holy Spirit to, to, to lead us, to correct us, to welcome his correction, to welcome his maturing process, uh, to welcome his direction and his leading Okay, and not to hide behind a hyper spirituality. Okay, I hope that makes sense. I hope I'm bringing a balanced perspective. I mean, I hope, you know, I'm wanting this to be biblical um, because we are meant to be, we are spiritual, but we're also soul, we're also body, right? And so again, it's the balance. It's the balance. And so, um, yeah, I don't want us to hide behind something and then not actually be able to grow and mature. So I hope this brings a little bit of clarity to the post that I did last month. And just gives a little more explanation, a little more teaching, a little more examples. And I hope, uh, you know, we can all grow in this area. We can grow in true wisdom. We can grow in true discernment, even dividing between soul and spirit, right? What is, what is spiritual? What is soulish? What is the Holy Spirit? What is not the Holy Spirit? Right? We all need to be growing in this, maturing in this. I'm on this journey, just like you are as well. And I hope this is helpful for you and that this teaching will encourage you to examine these things. And to ask yourself that question, you know, is this something that I'm, I'm doing? And is this something that I'm doing? And is, is, is it putting me in a cycle where I'm just going in circles? Okay, so hope it helps you. Hope it blesses you. And um, yeah, I just, yeah, we just wanted to jump on here for a few minutes and just give this quick encouragement, give this quick 
follow up. So I'll see you next time. Planning to do some more Facebook Lives in the coming weeks on different topics, some of them deliverance related, some of them otherwise. But I hope you can jump on when I do that as well. So God bless and I'll see you on here soon.